All right, so it's a uh, new quarter, and so I'll be uh, primarily teaching this quarter. In theory, I was primarily teaching last quarter, but between my travel and gospel meetings and everything else that happened, I wasn't up here very much. And then Steve, Steve again will be helping me out, so I appreciate him so much and his willingness to teach so obviously I won't be here every Sunday and so for those um, we'll have Steve or someone else who'll be filling in uh, as well. Um, as part of my introduction to this before I tell you kind of the topic for the quarter and Steve may have shared it last week because I, I gave it to him but if you flip over to Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 and if someone would read the first two verses for us, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with, the, with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, what do these verses mean to you? What is it, what are we being encouraged here to do? Okay, so to lay every lay aside every weight, which she's saying is sin, uh, so that we can run uh, faithfully. Other thoughts? Um, remember who we are, and more importantly, remember who He is. Okay. And what He's done for us. Okay. And what and, and what do you mean by that? More specifically. That, that He basically gave us the perfect example for us to strive for. And as long as we keep the faith, remember what we're trying to do, and keep depending on each other to help each other, then we will try to succeed in our lives so that we might have the reward that is coming to us. Okay. Okay, keep our eye on the finish line. There in verse 2, what does it say, the first part? Fixing your eyes on Jesus. Yeah, looking to Jesus, right? Looking is, is uh, Gina said too, you know, focusing on Christ, you know, thinking, looking, uh, looking to Him. And that, all of this implies, well, it's more than implies, it actually says, Right, that what what we're trying to avoid is what sin, sin, and 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 why so much focus on sin? It, it tells us because why is that such a problem? It can entrap us. It, it entraps us, right? It ensnares us. It and is it is that uncommon? What does it say? That it easily. Right? It, it easily ensnares us. It's, it's, our it, day. it's just it's not hard, right, in this life to get off track. Uh, it seems like, you know, I don't know. I'm either becoming my dad, which isn't a bad thing, or it, it just seems like every week I'm almost surprised by something that's going on in the world. Just like that we've taken another step in a particular direction that's not looking to Jesus. 
right? It's like we're looking away, and we're proud that we're looking away, and uh, not to be doom and gloom about that, but it just when I think that common sense on this topic has to be so obvious, and we make it not obvious, right? We make it complicated. We make it um, uh, confusing, and we know that you know God isn't the author of confusion. God's fairly clear on most things. We don't have to guess on a lot of stuff. He tells us what's what, and he tells us he's given us examples. Sent his son down to make sure we understand it. We can watch his life and and his listen to his teachings, and uh, you know it's not that complicated. But in this world, it can become complicated. Okay, in this world, it can become complicated. There's another thing here uh, that talks about how are we supposed to run? Patience, endurance, perseverance. You run the race to finish it. Paul said that. Okay. All right. So this is about obviously. You know, this is a, the you know, example is running a race, and you know we're trying to you know finish the race. Let's flip over to First Corinthians, uh, chapter nine. First Corinthians, chapter nine, and if you read verses twenty-four through twenty-seven, twenty-four through twenty-seven, what does that say? Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats <coughs> But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. All right, thank you. So here again, using the same kind of analogy of a race, right? Verse 24, and he says, you know, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But what? Only one receives the prize. Only one. Is, does only one receive the prize in the kingdom? No, no, no. Isn't that a great thing that we don't have to compete against each other? And that I have to run this better than you do or more perfect than you do? Uh, do we get caught up in that sometimes of doing the comparison of just got to be a little better than him. Who's better than who or who's, right? We don't have to do that. That's not, that's not how this race is set up, right? Most things in life, for you to win, someone else has to lose. Right? For you to get that promotion, someone else doesn't get the promotion, right? For you to, to whatever, win the, be the one that's chosen to get 50% off the donuts in the grocery store, someone else isn't going to get it. Okay, so that's not how it works in the church. We can all win. Everyone can win. And that's the message of the gospel, the good news, right? The good news is everyone can win if they choose to run the race and run the race the way it's intended to be run, which is what the second part of verse 24 says, right? He says, but one receives the Christ, he says, but run in such a way, what? That you may obtain it. Everybody can run the race in a way that they can obtain the prize. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. And what is that? Eternal life. Are we not all going to have eternal life? Amen. Good, yes. If we, if we, we will all 
if we can win our We will race, all have eternal life. So what's the imperishable crown? Look like. Yep, that's exactly right. Right when we were con- when we when we were conceived, we are. Remember, I've said in the past. Are you a body with a spirit, or are you a spirit with a body? You're a spirit with a body, right? So when you're conceived, you're you're a spirit. How long does that live? Forever. No matter what you decide to do, you're eternal. So we're all going to have eternal life. The question is, is where are we going to be? Are we going to be separated from God? Or are we not? Right? And we can be separated from God here. And even when we're separated from God here, does it not both rain on who? The just and the unjust. Even when you are separated from God and you don't do God's will here on this earth, we are still benefiting from God. Even as sinners, we benefit from God. People who reject Him are still benefiting from Him because there are still elements of morality. There are still things that He provides to all and people get, they get what's around but at some point, people will be ultimately fully separated from, there will be no access to good. Right? And so the imperishable crown that we strive for is to be with God. Right? Both here, and then it's just a transition. Right? It's not like, oh, I finally get to be with God. We should be with God here, and we just transition to be with him for eternity. Okay, And it says um, in verse 26, though, therefore I run thus, and here's a little bit what I want to focus on. We run, but we run how or how don't we run? How do we run? We don't run at your sword, we don't have an aim. Verse 26. Uh, not, not with uncertainty. What does that mean? You gotta know what you're doing. I'm sorry? You have to know what you're doing. Have to know what you're doing. You should have a goal in mind. We have confidence. Why are you doing it? We have confidence. You have confidence in what? Heaven. In what God said he would provide. In heaven. In the reasoning why you're running. Okay. Is it just why you're running, or do you also have certainty in how you're running? Is it, which one? Is it about, am I certain in how I'm supposed to run, or I'm certain why I'm running? Both. Okay. Okay. A little trick question there, trying to make sure you're awake. Okay, but it is both. So it's not just on why, the why is important, but you can also have certainty in how I'm supposed to run. Yeah. Right? Like, God didn't throw us at the start line, and it says start with a big banner. And there's no instructions where you're supposed to run. So when the gun goes off, everyone shoots off in a circle. And completely did. That's not how this race is. Yeah. Right? There's a lane. He tells us there's a path. There is a direction. And you can run that with certainty. You can run it with certainty. And if not, you can follow Lisa. She can tell you wherever she's running. That's where you go. So we can run with certainty. Because in verse 27, he gives an insight. Because at the end of 26, he says, Thus I fight. Now think about that. Thus I fight. What is he fighting? Not as one who beats the air. What does he mean by that? Aimlessly. Aimlessly, right? He's, he's focused. Not, I'm not fighting, just I know what I'm fighting. Yeah. I mean, when he's fighting, he's focused. He knows what his opponent is. And what's his opponent? Verse 27. Why? 
What about his body? What does he talk about? He says, but I what? Discipline my body and bring it under subjection. Okay, so his fight is where? Within. Within him. It's within him. He's not fighting someone else. No. Right? When we're running this race, am I fighting you? I'm no. not even running against you. No. Or said, my, my race is not with you. My fight is not with you, right? When you talk to runners, yeah, yeah, talk to, I mean, some, you just want to beat your own best time, right? You want to beat your time. It's not how I always am. I'm a very competitive person, and it usually works against me. But, you know, when we have a good frame of mind, what we're trying to do is better ourselves. Right? We're trying to better ourselves. And so each time you can feel proud, you can feel good, no matter where you come in, if you've disciplined yourself. Okay. I'm blanking on the other verse, but that, the other verse that talks about that I box is not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave. That's right. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole idea here is self discipline. And so that kind of introduces what I want to talk about. For this week, and I mean this quarter, this week, this quarter, is I want to talk about our attitude. And our attitude towards different topics. Right? So to be able to run this race, we need to prepare ourselves for the race. We need to discipline ourselves. We need to bring ourselves into subjection. And to do that, we need to have a view because, again, we're focused. We're not just running randomly. We need to have a view on certain topics um, so that we can run appropriately. And, but that starts with attitude. And we'll talk about things like what is our attitude. Next week we're going to talk about, so what is the Christian's attitude or what should the Christian's attitude be towards sin? We'll talk about that later here at the, at the end. Um, what is it towards capital punishment? What is it towards people serving in the military? What is it towards, you know, a lot of different forgiveness? What is it towards... Um, and so we'll think about some different topics about what our attitude should be because as you're running this race and you get presented with different things, we're going to, as humans, we're going to naturally just react. And we have to think if we brought our body, it's not just our physical body, most of the time it's our mind, right, into subjection so that we can run the race and finish the race, okay? So when you think about attitude, how would you define attitude? When you say, uh, what is our attitude or what's your attitude towards something? The way you behave. The way you behave? Mindset towards thinking. Okay, so thinking mindset towards something, right? You, you have a... You've got a conclusion about something and that's your attitude toward it. You, you have an opinion, okay. I guess. Response to a certain circumstance. Okay, it's a response. So we're pairing some things here. We're, we're talking about thinking, mindset. And we're also then connecting what with that in, in, in a lot of the comments that are made. So there's your mindset, and we're connecting it. A response is a what? It's an action. It's a behavior. Right, so we'll come to that. You guys are already making the connections, right? So, yeah. And so your attitude also encompasses your feelings. Okay. Because there's emotion in your attitude, right? So you have an attitude towards something. Some people see a Ford vehicle. And they have an attitude. It could be good. It could be bad. Some people see a Chevy. Or, you know. If you want to ride in class, you can get a Ram. Right? <laughs> okay. But 
You know, we have attitudes about all kinds of things, restaurants. Yeah. We have likes and dislikes, I mean. Yeah. But the, the word bias comes to mind as you, and we are talking about this subject, bias. Okay. Yeah. Does that, would that be? So what, what about bias? Bias, in fact, it goes right in line with everything that we say. Our bias could depend on how we think, feel. That's right. I think the bias kind of sums it all up. So we, so what, what is a, what is a bias? A favor, a, a predetermined preconceived. Yeah. yeah, it's okay to be biased toward cars or whatever. It's when you become biased toward people, yeah. whether it's in the color or national, that's when you get in trouble. Yeah. But it's okay to have an opinion on who made the best car or who made the best whatever. But it's like our filter, like how we filter information we okay. get. Yeah. And where does that filter come from? Our life experiences. Our experiences, right? Either our personal experiences or what we've been taught, right? Or just what we've absorbed, right? What, what you absorb creates your bias. What you see every day. The way you train your mind. The way you train your mind, right? <coughs> we have a sign over the door in our house that attitude is everything. Choose a good one. <laughs> Forget it. So yeah. The way you go about life is going to be impacted by your attitude, and that is trained by the way you, what you put into your head, if you will, what you put into your heart, trains your attitude and the things, your, your settled way of behaving and, and, and reacting to different things all comes from how you train yourself to develop and think. That's right. And so when you think about it, right, you, there's multiple ways to create your attitude or even the way that your bias is. And a bias isn't, are biases good or are they bad? Neither. They're both. They're both. Yeah. Right? I mean, could you, you not have a, a bias for Christianity? Yes. Right? Or you could have a bias for your brethren. Right? You could have a bias for a lot of, so a, a bias is just, it's a leaning, right? It's a favor, it's a, it's, a, it's a view, and it gets created, and it literally does get created. It can be created through what you're taught, it's created through your experiences. To Doug's point, it's created by you, intentionally created, right? So you can let it happen, and it just happens, but you can also shape it, right? You can shape your attitude, um, and you, you know, you you manage your mind, you manage your heart, you manage your thinking. So that that takes awareness that there is a bias, yeah. Yeah. good or bad. That's right, because it starts with awareness. Sometimes they're un, they're unconscious or not. Yeah. And if you hit a roadblock that don't disqualify us, it might mean we might need to take a new direction. Path. Yeah, because we will hit roadblocks, and so when you hit roadblocks, uh, it's the go through, go over, go under, go around, depending on what it, on what it is. Okay. Um, I had I had uh, one definition I looked for attitude was a settled way of thinking or feeling. To Sandy's point, right? It's also there's a feeling component. But it's a settled way. A settled way of thinking or feeling about someone or something. And then it says typically one that is reflected in a person's behavior. So then again, it ties the behavior. Out of those attitudes come action, comes behaviors, right? What does a settled way of thinking imply to you? What does that mean? Settled means that you have, you've already, that's it. Settled is something you have already within yourself agreed that that's fine, that that's what you're doing. You've settled. I've settled on, if I didn't come to the church of Christ, I wouldn't go anywhere. That's my opinion, and that's where I've settled. So, I don't okay. Uh, Any other thoughts? The way I think it's consistent. Yeah. It's consistent. So when you're settled, it's not easily moved, right? We don't want to be, I would suggest we don't ever want to be fully closed-minded. Okay, so one of the reasons we study, I mean, 
Have you ever studied a topic more than once? Yeah. <laughs> but like, why would you do that? Like, didn't you get it the first time? No. That's why I went back and looked again. Right? So, I mean, you study over and over because you keep learning depending on where you are and what you're able to receive. Yeah. Right? So, you want to keep your mind open to learning more, even about the similar topic. I mean, I know Harry and Mary, they read all the time. I mean, do you still learn anything? Right? I mean, you studied for years and years and years and years and years and years, and you still learn as you study, right? So you want to keep your mind open, but you are settled. It's going to take a lot to move me on some topics. I'm pretty settled in some topics because I've studied them hard, and I've thought about them, or even things in life. They proved themselves. And, yeah, they may have proven themselves in some way. Okay? So to me, it sounds like you've already debated it. It's already been discussed. You've already come to a conclusion. It wasn't that you just took it and absorbed it and that was it. Settled is, I guess I think of it in court terms, is, is that it's already been debated. It's already been hashed out. We have settled on this answer. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And unless new evidence comes to you, which sometimes as we go through our life and we figure things out, we're like, ooh, I never considered that part of it before. But unless new evidence comes, we have a position. And where I'm going here is, is that it's been pre-considered, right? It's, it's already been reasoned. And is that a good thing or is it not a good thing? For us to have reasoned things. You have it's always reasoned. a good thing to reason things. That's why teenagers have to become with attitude because they have to decipher between what's been taught versus what their attitude and belief is. Is it something they've just been taught? Is it something we just believe because our parents believed it? Or is it something that has substance to it? It's proven. Okay. I'm suggesting here that it is good for us to reason ahead of time on certain topics. Um, and it, it's even good to think about things that you may never encounter, is it not? Sure. Yes. Can you think of anything that you have reasoned ahead of time that you may never encounter? <laughs> on, what I, on what I would do is somebody tells me that a, unless you reject Jesus, we're going to shoot you, we're going to kill you, we're going to... I have thought about that ahead okay. of time. I hope we all have that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was no. talking about this with someone the other day. You know, my mind is settled. I like the word settled. Yeah. It may come to that one day. And I have thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great example. Yeah. You know, what what are you what are you gonna do if you know if someone breaks into your home? Have you ever thought about that? Yep. I got big. Yeah. You got vivid right then, huh? Did you just put a hurt on somebody? Okay. <laughs> and brother, you're talking about reasoning. It's good to reason because even God says in Isaiah 118, come, let us reason together and not just go into this situation blindly. Come, let us reason. Because what happens when we're surprised by something that we haven't thought about ahead of time? You're stunned. You're, you're at a loss. We don't always react at the right way. We don't always react the right way. Yes. Most of the time. Right? We don't always react the right way. Yep. I've got just coming here this morning. You know, I know tomorrow someone's going to have a conversation. I've got to have a conversation with someone tomorrow. Uh -oh. I'm already thinking about it because I know right now I don't feel like responding the right way. And I have to reason this and think about it a lot. So that when this happens, I do it the right way, right? And I'm actually thankful that I kind of know I'm going to have to have this conversation because if I didn't, I could get surprised in my natural, just whatever might take over. I may not bring myself into subjection, right? I may not discipline myself like I need to, right? And so thinking about things ahead of time are important. Uh, so that you know when someone knocks down the front door of your home. Well, 
I going to do? All right. Uh, when someone, uh, you know, you might think ahead of time about, am I going to get married? Am I not going to get married? All right. I get married. Am I going to have children? Am I not going to have children? I mean, there's things that it's not bad to reason, right? And then just instead of things happening, uh, a lot of things. You know, should I should I buy a home? Should I not buy a home? Should I rent? Should I lease? Should I, you know, a lot of things versus just jumping into it and then finding out this was not the best thing. I shouldn't have done this. Okay, should I have spent two hundred thousand dollars for my education and now I have no way to pay for it. You know, maybe we should have thought of that ahead of time. I don't know. All right? I mean, if we, if we thought about those things. Okay. So my point here is as we talk about these topics, it is good, it is necessary for us to reason, to think about it ahead of time before it hits us in the face. You may think, well, that's, I'm never going to have to deal with that. Well, you don't really know what you're going to have to deal with. And, and so I think it's important that we think of it um, ahead of time. Does the Bible talk about attitudes? Yes. Does it talk about attitudes? Isn't that what the whole B attitudes is about? Okay, there's the B attitudes. Does it say this is the B attitudes? Or does it call out, Paul say, or Jesus or someone say, here's the attitudes I want you to have? In Philippians, the second chapter. The fifth verse starting, I believe, it's a let this attitude be in you about how Jesus. Okay. Yes. Yeah, let this mind be in you. Yes, thank you. Right? Yeah. But your mind, your thinking, your settledness, right? That is kind of your attitude. That is your position. Right? So, in a roundabout way, it doesn't necessarily use the word attitude. But it's, but it's talking about attitudes, right? It's talking about your mindset and, and how you think. Look at, look at Matthew 5, given that was just raised. We'll go ahead and look at Matthew 5. They're easy verses. Someone, if you can just read 3 through 12. Matthew 5, 3 through 12. Um, and, and pick out, listen for what you think is an attitude because I would suggest probably not all of these are attitudes, but, but think about which ones are attitudes as you're listening to this. Matthew 5, 3 through 12. Someone read that? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Okay, thank you. So what are what are some attitudes in there? Pleasure the poor. Do you have a poor in spirit attitude? That's more of a state of being. Is that, I mean, is that an attitude? Yes, sure it is. Humility. Yes. Okay. Unproudful. Okay, so more like humility, yeah. not being proud, right? Humble. Not, not the haughty spirit. Not haughty. Humble. Does God love those who are proud? Wait, no, we're told, loves, right? That's one of the. He loves everybody, but yeah. he's not, not the proud. No, he's not going. Right. He's an exactly. arrogant, he's not going haughty to person. And I think we can kind of understand that too, right? Even in this earth, we kind of have a a violent, negative reaction typically to somebody who's really arrogant. Okay, it's a little hard to it's a little hard to stomach. What about verse 4? Is that an attitude? Yeah, absolutely. Blessed are those who mourn. Do you have a mourning attitude? 
I don't mean morning and evening. Yes. <laughs> Is that an attitude? Yes, sir. I think it's a state of mind. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it affects attitude because of the emotion behind it. Okay. I'll leave that one to you. I don't know if that's an attitude. Maybe it is. It's a, it's a, might be, whatever you, I'm, hey, I'm not the decision maker here, right? So <laughs> you, you, you decide, you study, work out your own salvation, okay? Uh, but, you know, or is he making a statement that blessed are those who mourn, you know, they'll be comforted. It might be still part of the humility piece, I don't know. <coughs> What else, without me going through each one of them, what are other ones that stick out to you that are clear attitudes? Meek. Those that hunger and thirst Being for meek. righteousness. Being Merciful. Okay. Peacemakers. Thirst for What'd righteousness. Meekness. Meekness. Yeah. Okay. Right. Merciful, I heard. Peacemakers. Being a peacemaker, a person of peace. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. Right. To be, a, to be an elder, what's one of the things you're not supposed to be that goes along with a peacemaker? What's the opposite of a peacemaker? A fighter. You're not supposed a fighter, right? You're not supposed to be a brawler. That's it. Right? Nothing like having an elder that's always looking for a fight. Okay? Uh, and it don't necessarily mean a physical fight he's looking for. It's, it's a fight. Just in yeah, general. Yeah. Being contentious. Yes. Right? We don't, yes. we don't need, you know, elders aren't supposed to be the ones who are running around dividing everybody. Okay? Uh, so blessed are the peacemakers. Can you have a, a mindset of peace? Can you have a mindset of mercy? Very nice. And, and, and how natural is that? Right? right. To be merciful. Right? To be to make peace. I will be tested tomorrow on the peacemaker. And you know, it's not natural, but he says that's what he said you need to be. I'm afraid. What's that? If you have to change, it's not, it's not natural. It's what you become as you go through life and learn. You become the, these things. Okay. And, then, and then in verses 10, 11, 12, right, I don't know if those are attitudes as much as just they are. Stay very blessed are those who are persecuted, right? You're going to be persecuted. Um, and our... Last minute or two, flip over to Second Thessalonians. I'll read this. Second Thessalonians 2, uh, 10 and 12. Is that right? Second Thessalonians 2. Okay. And with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive, they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they should, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The point here that I was wanted to tie in is that. It's important for us to strive for truth, that we don't believe the lie, that we discern for ourselves, that we think of this ahead of time, that we consider, that we get settled on critical topics, on on certain things. And we only have another minute. We're going to talk about Christian's attitude towards sin. And I don't want us to think about, I don't want you just to go, oh, sin is bad. Okay. <coughs> we all know sin is bad. Yeah. I want you this week to think about what is your attitude towards sin? To think about how do you feel towards sin? And when you think about other people engaged in sin, how do you think about them? When you see people in sin, Do you envy them? Right. Do you, you know, how, how do you, when you look around in the world and you see all of everything that's going on, how do you feel about it? How do you, when you see certain things that are happening, are you, are you kind of wishing you're part of the party? 
You know, and that could be on all scales and levels and spectrums, right? Is all sin pleasurable? Are we looking at sin as in the way God looks at sin, with all sin is equal, or are we looking at sin from our lens of there's big sin, sin little sin. sin? Somebody said a curse word, oh my, but they're gay, so oh, they're condemned. So I want you to think about this week. Okay. <laughs> That's his own point. I want you to be thinking about sin this week. Okay. Not doing it. No, don't okay. practice it. Just think about it. Don't practice it. Okay. Don't tell me all the things you did this week for for the class. Okay. But I want you to I want you to think about how do you feel about sin? Do we glamorize sin? Right? Where how is it in your mind? Is it something that we kind of long for? Because, you know. There are scriptures that say the pleasure of sin. Is it pleasurable? Is it pleasurable to covet? Yeah. <coughs> Is it pleasurable? You know, what, how, what's your attitude towards it? How do you think about it, right? Other than we're just conditioned to say sin is bad. And of course, sin is bad. You know, it separates from God. But that's not going to help you run the race, right? Understanding what all sin is, how it impacts us, where it is, our attitude towards it, our attitude, our attitude towards those who, are, who have it, it's clinging on them, right? People who are, they're trying to run and it's just, they can never, they can never get up any speed, right? Because of the weight of the world, the weight of, of sin, right? How do we, how do we look at that? How do we think about it? How do we feel about it, right? What's your attitude towards sin and towards those who are caught in sin? Right? So think about this this week. You know, instead of SpongeBob, maybe watch a little bit of. You know, think about think about that for uh, a little bit. All right. Thank mm-hmm. you.